Yesterday I went to Benito Juarez High School in uh, Chicago. It's near uh, the southwest part of the city, Pilsen neighborhood. It's a predominantly Mexican-American uh, enrollment at this high school. It's one of my favorites. I've been there time and again for so many different events. It is full of life and full of some amazing young students and some great teachers and a great principal, Mr. O'Conn. And uh, I was there two weeks ago for a mariachi band ensemble, uh, training students across the city uh, to be musicians in the Mexican tradition. Uh, there's just so much life there. But yesterday was not the happiest occasion. It was sad and worrisome because I met with about 20 of the students there, all of whom had been protected by DACA. DACA was the executive order of President Obama, which was issued in 2012. And that executive order said that if you were brought to the United States as a child, an infant, a toddler, a young person, and grew up in this country undocumented, if you had no problems of any serious nature with the law, if you finished your education, you'd go through a criminal background check, pay your fee, and be protected. Be able to stay in America two years at a time to go to school, to work, whatever your aspirations may be. Under that executive order of President Obama, 780,000 young people came forward. And the 20 that I met at Benito Juarez were among them. And they got the protection they needed to get a job, legally get a job. And for a lot of these young students, that's a critical part of their lives because they don't qualify, being undocumented, for any federal assistance to go to college. Uh, if they want to go to college, they have to save up for it, and they have to find the money and work for the uh, tuition and other expenses. So getting a job is a very important part of it. And these young people as well, um, as they went through the DACA process, knew that they were safe from being deported. That is a fear which many of us can't even understand, but it's a real fear for many people in this country who are here undocumented. So for these young people, they had that chance. On September the 5th, President Trump announced that he was ending the DACA protection program as of March 5th of next year, putting it into the protection that these young people have. And as their DACA expired, they would be vulnerable to deportation. They would reach the point where they could no longer work in America. The end of DACA as we know it will dramatically change the lives of thousands of young people. It'll change the lives of 900 of these DACA-protected young people who volunteered to serve in our military. Currently serving in our military, willing to risk their lives for a country which will not give them legal status. Imagine that for a moment. If they had to prove that they really cared about America, what more could they do than put their lives on the line? They've done it, 900 of them. When DACA goes away, March 5th of next year, they have to leave the military service. That is the end of their opportunity to serve America. And many of them are in the military because they bring special skills and special capacities to lead. So we'll lose them. And it means 20,000 of these DACA-protected young people, when it goes away for them, will no longer be able to teach. 20,000 teachers across America. I met uh, one of them yesterday. Catherine Galliano. Catherine I'd met before, she's a special ed teacher. Family originally came from Nicaragua. She told a heartbreaking story about what happened 10 years ago. She was in high school, taking a shower in the morning before she was going to school. There was a knock on the bathroom door. Her mother was crying and screaming, come out, come out, come out. And Catherine ran out to see that her father, they put handcuffs on her father and they were deporting him to Nicaragua. He was gone, that was the last time he saw her and she saw him 10 years ago. She told that story and she told how her mother tried to make it as a single mom with her kids here in the United States and finally gave up and went back to Nicaragua, leaving Catherine to raise herself, to pay her own way through college, to get a teaching certificate and teach special ed in the city of Chicago. As of March 5th next year, Catherine is finished teaching, it's over. DACA is gone. So when I met with these students yesterday, you can imagine what they're worried about. 
They're worried about themselves and their future. They're worried about their families. They're worried about turning over all this information to the government when they signed up for DACA, which can now be used against them and their families. That's what they're worried about. And many of them, I'm sure, reflect on the fact this could be their last Christmas in the United States of America. If that seems overly dramatic, then you need to meet them and talk to them and understand the reality of their lives. That's what they face. Well, President Trump did eliminate, prospectively, the DACA program, but he issued a challenge to us. He said to Congress, now do something. If I'm going to eliminate this executive order, what are you going to do? In the United States Senate, in the House of Representatives, will you pass a law to deal with this challenge? He said that in September, and here we are in the middle of December having done nothing, nothing. And the clock's ticking. And it's a clock that means an awful lot to thousands of young people across America, including those at Benito Juarez High School in the city of Chicago. There are people who want to get this fixed. There are Republicans and Democrats who do. We need to come together and get this done. There is no excuse for delay. We know what needs to be done. We need to give these young people a chance. I introduced the DREAM Act 16 years ago here in the Senate. And the DREAM Act said for these young people, we're going to put you on a path to legalization, a path to citizenship. It won't be easy and it won't be quick, and you have to show us that you can be a productive part of America's future. But then we give you your chance. These young people who grew up in the United States of America pledging allegiance to that flag, singing our national anthem, believing in their heart of hearts this was home. But it really wasn't legally. They were undocumented and illegal in America. Now the question is, what will we do to make that better, to fix it, to come up with a just solution? Some of my Republican colleagues say, well, you've got to give us more than just fixing their problem. You've got to give, give us some fix to our immigration system. I'm not against that. I was part of a, grant, a group of eight senators that spent months together, four Democrats, four Republicans. We crafted a comprehensive immigration bill, which I am proud of. It passed on the floor of the Senate, sent over to the Republican House representatives, which refused to even consider it, would not bring it up for a vote. It died in the Republican House. I know this immigration system in America is broken. I've talked about, one, talked about one specific piece of it this morning. But there are many aspects of it that are broken. What the Republicans have said to us, do something to make our borders stronger. Sign me up. I voted for that on the Comprehensive Immigration Bill. Does that mean more technology, more equipment, making certain that it's clear that our border is going to be a real border, that you cannot cross it at will? Of course. I'm prepared to do that, and many Democrats, maybe all the Democrats, would join in that effort. There are things that we can do to fix this system, but what we cannot do is ignore it. We cannot ignore what's happening to these young people, the threat to their future, to their families, and we can't ignore the reality that this is a basic test of who we are as Americans. I stand here today as the son of an immigrant mother. My mom came to this country brought to this country when she was two years old. And thank goodness that my grandmother decided to put her on a boat, bringing her from Lithuania to the United States. I wouldn't be here otherwise. That's my story. That's my family's story. That's America's story. That's who we are. I cannot imagine my grandmother and grandfather, whom I never knew, making the decision to come to a country where they didn't even speak the language giving up everything and leaving it behind in their mother country of Lithuania to try in a new country called the United States of America. But that story has been repeated millions of times, and thank goodness it has, because they not only brought strong backs and strong minds, they brought with them a part of their DNA, which was a DNA of culture and courage and determination. And I think that's part of who we are as Americans and proud to be. Let me tell you the story of one of these dreamers, as I call them, or DACA young people, because all my speeches notwithstanding, these stories tell more about this situation than anything I could possibly say. This is Maria Roca. I've told stories of dreamers on the floor. 
She's 101, I believe, of the list that I've given. She came to the United States at the age of three, brought from Mexico. Maria grew up in a rural town called Stonewall, Texas. Her fondest memories growing up in the Texas Hill Country include haystack jumping, armadillo chasing, and fishing in a lake. Later in her childhood, Maria's family moved to San Antonio. Maria was a very good student. She graduated from high school, 12th in her class. She played varsity soccer. She was recognized as a San Antonio Scholar Athlete of the Week during her junior year. At the same time as she was going to school and playing soccer, she was working a job to help support herself and her family. She was accepted at the University of Texas at San Antonio. While enrolled as a full-time student, she kept right on working. In fact, she juggled three different jobs. She was a housekeeper, a babysitter, and a personal assistant. She had to come up with $40,000 out of pocket to pay for college education because she didn't qualify for any federal assistance because of her immigration status. So these young students in college are working harder than many others just to make sure they succeed. In May of 2012, she graduated with a degree in inter interdisciplinary studies. And after graduation, she decided to enter a program known as Teach for America. Most everyone knows about this program, but they should know. This is when college graduates volunteer to teach in some of the most challenging schools across America. Maria was one of those. Today, Maria continues her career as a teacher. She teaches third grade in her hometown of San Antonio, Texas. At the same time, she's pursuing a graduate degree in education. Once again, no federal assistance, no federal loans. Without DACA, Maria would not be able to work and could be deported immediately. When asked what would happen to her without DACA protection, which President Trump eliminated as of March 5th next year, Maria only thinks of her students, and here's what she said. How are my students going to take it? What's going to happen to them? That's what scares me. Nationwide, there are 20,000 DACA recipients just like her. With Teach for America alone, 190 of these undocumented students who've gone on to get degrees in college are teaching in the Teach for America program. Currently, they're teaching 10,000 students across 11 states, a third of them in the state of Texas. In a few weeks, uh, Congress is going to face the reality of this DACA provision by, by President Trump coming into full effect. As of that day, she and others like her will start the clock ticking to lose their jobs be unemployable, legally unemployable in America. Mr. President, Christmas is a special time of year for every family of Christian faith and those who observe. It's a special time of year for my family. The real question, though, is can we leave? Can we leave this week ignoring this issue? Can we go home and enjoy our Christmas without thinking for a moment of how young people like Maria may be facing their last Christmas in the United States of America. That's the reality of what she faces. So why don't we face this issue? This is an empty Senate chamber, which is usually the case, unfortunately. I wish it were filled, filled with a healthy, fulsome debate on this issue. Let's have our disagreements, bring them out. Let's work out our compromises. Let's do something that's really radical around here. Let's come together and legislate, Democrats and Republicans. Let's solve this problem. That's why we were elected, not to collect a paycheck and build a pension, but to solve the problems facing America. This one is real. It is timely. It is now. For Maria Roca, for 780,000 other young people, they're counting on us to do something. Let's not come up with excuses. Let's come up with answers.